can you tell me like you participate is it the first time that you participated in the in the the international climate change conference yes. organized by uh, what is your feedback on it it was like, really nice. I mean, I, I just did one session, which is my session, because it was a busy day for me. But uh, it was very nice. I mean, I enjoyed it. I could see the audience uh, both online and uh, you know, in, per uh, in person. There was, I mean, as in some people are dialed in online, and then there's a room which is connected. So it was very nice to, to see lots of young people in the audience. Uh, all right. So also now looking climate change it's uh, mainly a human induced phenomenon and it is important that we uh, address this to address this we need to create awareness and also you know include sustainable lifestyle among people so looking at climate change education and also sustainable education uh, how important is it and how do you suggest uh, especially the south asian region implement it I think so. This is very important indeed because we must. We are fortunate, I think, in South Asia that there is not so much uh, myth, climate denial. Yes. So that is one one thing that we have seen. In fact, we did an analysis once of some of news uh, in the top uh, five Indian newspaper uh, newspapers from India, the U.S., Australia, and Nigeria, and. Um, you know, clearly compared to the US and Australia, India and Nigeria did not have so much of uh, climate misinformation. And I think that is true for the global south most broadly. But um, that said, we don't really know what climate change is going to bring to the region. So I think we need a lot more information, especially not so much on mitigation, but I'd have to say adaptation. Yes. Well, of course, because that is very critical for us. You know, this the we uh, South Asia is going to be so vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And uh, we really need that awareness to go to everybody. So, for instance, doctors, engineers, I would say all, all spheres of um, MBAs, you know, so many spheres of education where uh, it's not mainstream. It has to really go into all kinds of curricula so that people know. A doctor should know how to manage during a heat wave if you have to do surgeries, for instance. Engineers should know how to make better air conditioning, uh, which is not so energy intensive. I mean, any, any sphere of life, I think it's going to impact everything. So we really need to, you know, humanities needs to learn it in terms of how can you have art responding to climate uh, disasters. And this. so I think we, we really need that mainstreaming. So how do you suggest, uh, like there are a couple of gaps between the thought of uh, implementing uh, sustainable education and actually implementing it. So how do you suggest we overcome these gaps and actually implement this maybe in the education system or also general awareness among the majority of people i think two ways one is it first needs to get into the school curricula and uh, undergraduate curricula so we need to work with education ministries across uh, the place as well as state you know, state and national education ministries and uh, rewrite textbooks like i said to mainstream it you know i think often what, what people do is they just add a chapter on climate change and this you know young people already have so much in their curricula that you add another one then the teachers make it all optional you know culture you have to mainstream it into those uh, so i think that is one thing the second is that's a long process i think that will always take time and it will be some in some places that it catches on but we need to also have a lot of therefore uh popular networks i think teacher networks which can see how to communicate this itself mm -hmm. scientists to come out with information that is easy for people to access teaching aids for instance so let's say while we are waiting for the ministries to adopt textbooks can we as educators come out with uh, simple education material that uh, people can use on sustainable development? So if you're a teacher, for instance, I'll give you an example. Uh, we were very pleased just now to see this on Twitter that uh, we, my colleague Seema Mundoli and I had put out a book called So Many Leaves, which is for children on leaves, uh, just you know to understand that there are large leaves, small leaves, sticky leaves, hairy leaves, very for very young children. But we just saw that uh, in um, the Andaman Islands, in the middle Andamans, a school has, um, you know, for very young children, they're actually enacting it, bringing the leaves and showing. Uh, so it's very nice. So I think these kinds of, um, you need, there is a lot of now very good material from South Asia, which is children's books mm -hmm. on sustainability, which is not preachy, but fun. Mm -hmm. And I think we need those kinds of things also. Agreed. Uh, so also now, Looking at the, the ancient way of living, the indigenous ways of living, especially in the South Asian region, it used to be quite sustainable to begin with. 
but with development technology and globalization i feel like we are all becoming a part of the problem and becoming responsible for climate change so how much has uh, technology and globalization affected the uh, the the rapid you know increase in the climate change see it has affected it in multiple ways i mean technology can be good and bad it depends on how you deploy it but what has happened with globalization and technology is we have disconnected ourselves from the nature that sustains us you know your food comes from somewhere your water comes from somewhere your energy comes from somewhere your waste disappears you might generate a lot of plastic and the waste goes somewhere else right so i think the challenge is we don't we are not we don't see that water comes from i mean i'll give you an example of bangalore people used to worship the wells and the lakes because water used to come from there but now water comes from the kaveri which is uh, you know um, so many kilometers away hundreds of kilometers away so why if it's 100 kilometers away why would you bother to sustain this nature so the wells are filled in the lakes are polluted you know your waste goes in somewhere else so we we had i think one thing that south asia had which we need to return to a spiritual traditions of sacred nature and there in diverse religions it's not one religion every religion you know in the south asian continent has always believed that uh, nature is sacred and if we can go back to some of those ideas and as well as uh, you know going back to somehow living in um, understanding where uh, how to live with the nature around us that we are dependent on the services that nature provides in our immediate midst so i think that is something we need to try getting back to um and also you men mentioned that uh, we should focus more more on adaptation and less on mitigation because we don't really contribute much in terms of greenhouse gases right so we are extremely vulnerable as an equatorial country uh, to the impacts of climate change yes. so what like and also in the the coming decade and the near future we really have to become more and more resilient and adapt to the exactly. extreme weather conditions so how do you suggest that these countries uh, take forward the whole adapting and becoming resilient see there are two things i think at the country scale you know governments need to adapt, uh, respond to both mitigation and adaptation you know for instance india has very aggressive green energy targets and wants to has committed to net zero i think all of this is very important and the government should do that but as people as communities i think we need to focus on adaptation so i'm making that link more mm -hmm. because more often local communities are not really as you said indigenous communities poor communities they are not contributing to mitigation so teaching them about mitigation and making that their focus is, is does not really make sense and they need to focus on adaptation and there are many aspects which we are currently not understanding uh, we want to have technological and technical solutions for instance you know we are looking at coastal resilience and you want to build sea walls but you're busy destroying mangroves so we should actually be protecting our mangroves and the uh, coastal line not building sea walls uh, i mean we might need to still build some sea walls but we should not do that at the expense of uh, keeping our natural infrastructure or uh, you know we looked at many heat action plans in that cities have and they are largely focused on for instance using smss to get people out of the heat and into community shelters which is very important but we also need to be planting trees and uh, greening the areas and restoring the water bodies the lakes and the you know the rivers so that people uh, it get the city gets naturally cooled and there's much more greenery to cool the surfaces or instead of painting roofs white can you have um, rooftop gardens which increase the mm -hmm. uh, health resilience also because people can eat better so mm -hmm. those are the kinds of things things i think we should be looking at really uh so looking at the cop 27 last year they focused a lot on loss and damage and funding the vulnerable countries what are your thoughts on that i think it's an excellent start we really need loss and damage for our kinds of countries are the way forward and uh, we really need to be focusing on getting this fund the thing is the challenge with all of these negotiations is the language is still very high level so who will contribute how much will they contribute when will they contribute what is the process towards that all that has to be figured out and that's where people with the wealthier countries will be hesitant to actually put numbers into this and uh, you know that's where the challenge but as a start i think it's an excellent start we just need to make sure that we get the language more concrete and the benefits really start flowing in for the countries that have been that are that are going to suffer loss and damage yeah uh, and also uh like how is the level of awareness among the general public 
regarding climate change, especially like, for example, the Western world are more well versed and they're uh, quite literate in terms of what climate change is and they have been taught this in school. But looking at the South Asian region, a lot of people are not too bothered about climate change because they have bigger problems like finding food and, you know, general basic necessities. So how do you think that uh, society would contribute to mitigate uh, climate change and would they really be, you know, interested in something like this? I think we have to make that direct connect for them. So, you know, for instance, these are, I mean, uh, most uh, most people in South Asia, large population still is farming. And so farming communities, yes, they are looking at their daily bread and when of money and us. But all of that is related to climate change very clearly. Seasons changing precarity of agriculture. And so that connection we can very strongly make. And uh, for instance, uh, certain kinds of agricultural changes to make them more water secure and uh, use less fertilizers and pesticides are actually very good for climate mitigation and adaptation. So there are a lot of these low-hanging fruit that we can actually look at, which are helping mitigation and adaptation and making that direct link. Coastal communities in many parts of South Asia are clearly seeing it. They're already retreating under climate change and they are finding that. So they see it very clearly, you know, and uh, in cities they are seeing that there is increased risk of flooding, of heat waves, of uh, extreme events of various kinds. So they are seeking. So I think we have, they are seeing that there are changes going on. We have to make that connection for them and try and figure out how can we make interventions that are not costing them, making them bear the bear the burden of the cost of adaptation. Uh, so you, you actually mentioned there's uh, less misinformation in the South Asian region regarding climate change maybe due to the lack of awareness or maybe people just take it as it is but like what 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 are your thoughts on climate change denials or climate change misinformation within this region i think it's so it's clearly not as bad that we can clearly see there is less information maybe but you know that also with uh, young people nowadays who are involved in very clear climate change advocacy movements there's a lot of good information are out there but uh, I so I think one of the things is the lobbies, the you know the uh, fossil fuel lobby is much um, is more uh, much far more active in the U.S. and North America, and Australia and countries like that. It has really not been so active in South Asia. So uh, you know it's, it is so so we because a lot of the misinformation is active lobbying of certain kinds, and here also the governments have been more proactive always. So the governments are stepping up to have aggressive targets and uh, so. Yeah, den denial is not misinformation becomes a problem, you know, misinformation of various kinds of who is responsible or what should be done. That becomes more of a problem. I'm not saying there is no misinformation. I think there's still a lot of misinformation that needs to be tackled. But yes. the misinformation is multiple things, you know, it's always it's combined with either, let's say, uh, ethnic violence or uh, it is some um, anti poverty, something or it's um, you know, gender rights, so something like that is all mixed in with climate change. So it's very hard to do this. Is, I mean, you, you know that better than me, that it's very hard to do misinformation, uh, you know, address which is which is only on climate change. It has to be climate change plus many factors together. Yeah, so thank you very much. Those are all the questions I had actually finished before before actually less than the time we expected and thank okay. you so much for your time and uh we're definitely happy to talk yeah so one of the things i wanted to tell you was which uh, and we'd be happy to connect later on this also so at tazim Primji university we've started running so i also lead the climate set center for climate change and sustainability mm -hmm. and one of the things we do is because media is such an important uh, lever to combat misinformation so we have started these workshops for experienced media professionals on how to do climate change uh, journalism. And we've called it uh, Earth Spend. So it's an Earth Spend series. We had one in Bangalore We have for the south. We have one in Guwahati for the northeast of India. And we're going to do Delhi, Mumbai, and uh, then you know circle through different parts of India in the next. Uh, they've been very good. We do about 35 to 40 people. And we do various things, including a session on how to do fact checking, right. how to do better storytelling, how to do fact checking, how to read scientific papers how to ask for the right quotes, you know, a lot of different things related to this. And because it's experienced journalists who are already covering these issues, I think it's a very targeted way. So we, it's nice to, I mean, again, I was very uh, interested, very intrigued when you, when you wrote to me 
to find out that there's an organization like this. Yeah. And I think these are exactly the kinds of initiatives we need. So I think I will definitely put like the Indian team specially in touch with you where they can participate in these uh, Absolutely. Uh, workshops for sure. That's really useful, I think, especially for us. Uh, and thank you very much for your time. Sure. And agreeing to talk to us. Sure. Good luck. Good luck with everything. Thank you very much. Yeah.